the past that we'll look at uh, some other materials. But this evening we'll actually be concluding the text, and next week we'll just be looking at some different lessons from Psalm 119. And tonight um, we're looking at verses 169 to the end of the chapter. And again, we're using Brother Patterson's uh, outline for this class. As I said before, now this being the last uh, class, or last uh, outline for this chapter, uh, you will have all the uh, notes that Brother Patterson includes in his. Uh, but next week we will continue, obviously, and we'll looking at some other lessons. And he has titled this, Brother Patterson has titled this section, How to Use the Tongue. And again, looking here first at verse 169, it says, Let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. And let's, I feel like I've been moving a little slow all day. Let me get over and flip the slide here. We may use the tongue to pray, as, as Brother Patterson has this pointed out here in 169. We are taught to pray, and a proper prayer will come to the Lord's attention. And going back to the, to the verse, it says, Let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. And what I'll point out before, we may have talked about this in, in the past, uh, because here, it uh, seems like this year, this has been my verse to, to use a lot of. Going back to Psalm 159 and verse 2, it says, But your iniquities have separated, you, separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, you keep that in mind. You go back to look at what we're looking at this evening in verse 169. And he says, I'm like, cry, uh, come near before thee, O Lord. Well, you keep that in context. You look at the context there of Isaiah 59, uh, verse 2. What he's telling us is that those who are, have never come to Christ, those who are, are uh, we would, would say sometimes, are, you might use the term lost, their prayers cannot come before God because, as we see here in verse 2, their sins have separated, have separated them. But also, as Christians, we know that we can fall away, we can become unfaithful, and we can be returned, returned back to a life of sin if we are not faithful to God as we should. And a person who has fallen away, well, their sins would fall in the same category here in verse 2. Or their sins or their iniquities have separated them, separated between you and your God. So if we want to have our prayers heard, we have to make sure we have a right relationship uh, with God. It doesn't mean we can't pray to God for forgiveness, but what I want us to, to keep in mind is that a person who has fallen away from the church, not that's not merely just someone who has sinned, but someone who has gone back into the world, or someone who has never come to Christ for the first time, well, their sins are separated them from their God, from God, and their prayers cannot be heard until they are made right uh, in the sight of God. It's one of the reasons James tells us to confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man uh, avails much. Uh, same idea here. If we have sin in our lives, if we have returned back to the world, we have to take care of those things so that our sins, or so that our prayers, rather, can be heard before God. Now, looking at our next verse, in verse 170, it says, Let my supplication come before thee, deliver me according to thy word. And Brother Patterson's given us a heading, we need to meet our needs. Man's ne deepest need, man's deepest need is to be saved. And we think about that, we know sometimes, if you're a Bible class teacher, or if you're a gospel preacher somewhere, uh, and when I say Bible class teacher, don't just mean the men, but also uh, the ladies who teach maybe ladies' classes or whatever the case may be in your local congregation. Uh, sometimes we can get caught up in other topics and ideas, and we forget the purpose behind everything. That is that we may have a right relationship with God and have eternal life. So the man's deepest need uh, is to be saved. Excuse me. We go back and look at verse 170. He says, Let my supplication come before thee, and deliver me according to thy word. Now, my supplication is a prayer. Supplication is just a type of prayer. He says, Let my supplication or prayer come before thee, deliver me according to thy word. Now, delivering him is a reverence, uh, reference, obviously, to being uh, freed from sin, being saved. He says, Also, that it be done according to his word, according to God's word. 
Uh, and with that in mind, man cannot be saved unless they are saved God's way. If we want to have salvation like they did in the New Testament, we have to do things that uh, do do in such a way as they did in the New Testament. We do Bible things in Bible ways. Revelation 3 in verse 17. Revelation 3 and verse 17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Now, he says here, Consider the fact that riches will not meet man's deepest needs. Uh, we know, of course, we do need some things in this life. We have uh, you know, we have to have money of, uh, in some form or in some amount so we can pay our bills and feed, feed ourselves and take care of our, our wives and our husbands and our families and all those types of things. But he, he says here that they will not meet man's deepest needs. Now, man's deepest needs are not physical, so man's deepest needs must obviously be spiritual in nature. So riches will not meet man's deepest needs, that is, spiritual needs. Riches cannot get us into eternal life. It doesn't matter who you are. You go back and look at verse 17 here in Revelation 3, where he says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need, need of nothing. And he's saying, he gives this viewpoint of someone who's saying to themselves, I'm rich, I have a lot of goods, I don't need anything. When in reality, as Christ goes on to say, No, it's not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind and naked when christ says they are actually the opposite they are not rich they are not increased with goods they are not they do have need of something it's eternal life he says they're wretched they're miserable they're poor they're blind they have uh, nothing at all because their riches will not meet their deepest needs that is their spiritual needs and but a person goes on to say perhaps the psalmist is praying so because he realizes that god will supply Every need of man. We look at Philippians chapter 4. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse uh, 19. It says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, as you see there, he says, My God shall supply all your need. And what we have to remind some friends of ours sometimes especially those who'd like to watch televangelists and those who'd like to uh, listen to some of the uh, wealth uh, preachers who speak on wealth. That is, you do what they ask you to do, you know, you'll be wealthy. When we see here the Christ, or see here rather the, the New Testament, uh, this is not Christ speaking, but, he's, but the Bible tells us that God will supply all of our needs. And we have confused sometimes with the difference between a need and a desire, or a need and a want. We do not need a mansion, but we do need housing. We do not need a expensive car, but we do need perhaps a vehicle uh, or some way of transport from going to point A to point B. Uh, you know, sometimes we bemoan how how old our vehicles are. Uh, but I'm, I have no problem having a car that requires no car payments. Uh, you know, sometimes we have to repair things, and people will say, well, you know, you better off just buying a new car. In some cases, that may be true, but I'll replace a, a, and do some repairs for a few hundred dollars if I wanted to do it once a year, rather than having to pay a car payment for multiple hundreds of dollars every month for several years. And I'm not saying a new car is bad. I'm just saying that... Our, de our needs are not the same as our desires. Uh, we need food, but we don't need the fanciest food. Uh, we need clothing, but we don't have to have the most expensive clothing. Uh, but some will confuse that uh, need and desire. We may need a telephone or a home, but it does not. Uh, we do not have to have a uh, brand new iPhone or a brand new uh, cell phone, the most expensive one. Uh, wife and I are, were looking at upgrading our cell phones and we aren't available for a free upgrade. I'm not until a couple months, uh, two months, and she's not until next year sometime. Well, I'd, I would like to have a new one, but I'm not about to pay for it. If, I, if all I do is wait a few months, uh, two months, and I'll be able to get a new one for free. Uh, because, we, if, you know, someone would say, well, I need that. Well, 
all we need is something to, to really get us by and to accomplish what we what we have or accomplish our goals. Uh, so you know we can always wait or, or do something a little bit differently. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I have broken my phone or lost my phone or dropped it or something. And instead of buying a new one expensively off the internet or from uh, the store or from the uh, company itself, I'll go and and buy a twenty dollar phone that just it works and does what I need to do until it's time to upgrade. And in fact, that's usually what I always do. But you think about what the point we're looking at, need and desire, the world has confused that in a huge, huge way. And in many circumstances, and not all of them, uh, that's where some, some people have gotten a lot of trouble financially. They say, well, I need this brand new car. Well, no, that's not really true. You may need transportation. In some cases, people are, are, ready, are willing to, or instead of buying a, a bus pass or paying for a taxi or something, uh, they'll buy a, a brand new vehicle and use that to go from one, point A to point B. Uh, I know one person who he could have rolled, he could have drove his car about 20 miles and got on the bus and rode the bus all the way into his job and rode the bus back, and and ended up putting only you know 40 miles a day on his vehicle instead of putting close to 100 or more and spending all that gas money. Well, instead he drove. And the point is, we don't, we should not be confusing our needs and our desires or our wants. Uh, we need certain things, but we don't, all of our needs, uh, some of our needs we have confused, or some of our wants we have confused with needs. So we have to be careful with that. Uh, next, verse 171. Let me back up here. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 171. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. And Brother Patterson says here, we need to praise God. And he simply gives two references. And let's look at those. Philippians chapter 1. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 11. And we were just talking about needs and wants. I think I have a, a sermon on, on that. I'll have to look. One of you might want to put a reminder in that chat box before we leave, and I'll look look for that before I uh, log off. But I think I have a lesson on that. Uh, anyway, going back to verse 11. Sorry, sometimes things just pop in there as you're going along. Uh, Philippians 1, verse 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, we are by which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Uh, we need, the point of the person points out here is we need to praise God. We need to praise God for all that he has done for us, all that he is doing for us currently, and all that he has promised to do for us in the future. And we well, sometimes we, we think about what he's done for us. We well, we fail to realize what he's doing for us currently and what he's going to do for us in the future. He is currently uh, preparing a place for us, as uh, the Gospel of John bears out for us. But also he is, we are going, he is promised that we will the faithful will be there with him. So he's doing something for us currently, and he is going to do something for us in the future as well. Uh, Revelation 19 and verse 5. Revelation 19 and verse 5 says, And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Praise our God, all ye his servants. And followers of Christ are servants of God. And so we should praise him because he is worthy to be praised. And we can list all kinds of reasons, and then we would never even scratch the surface. Uh, there's so many reasons why we should give praise to God. And one of those reasons is uh, is commanded of faithful followers of God to praise him. Looking next at Psalm 119, verse 172, or yes, verse 172. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteous. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteous. We need to speak or preach the word. This is how Brother Patterson has titled this. We need to speak or preach the word. It's not uncommon, and this has been the problem throughout time, throughout all time. We have those who speak the truth, but they don't always speak the whole truth. Or maybe they speak what we call a, or preach what we call a social gospel. That is one that doesn't really upset anyone. One that never really even calls anyone to repentance. Uh, you know, when you're traveling sometimes, but be on vacation or for other reasons, 
and you visit a congregation maybe you've never been there before, and you sit down, you listen to lesson, and you consider some of the things they say, and, and not everything is going to be negative many times. But the problem we have sometimes with individuals is when they say speaking the word of God, they speak or preach a, a social gospel. One that doesn't call anyone to repentance. One that's more of a, a motivational type of speech. And there is no uh, call for repentance, no uh, plea uh, for turning oneself away from sin. And many will, don't even offer the invitation at all. So when we, when we speak or when we preach, we need to preach the word of God. He says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteous. All the commands of God are righteous. All the commands of God will lead a man to eternal life. And he has here for us to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Which says, Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. And we look there, he says, preach the word. That's what we're to preach. That is the word of God. He, then he tells us when to preach it. Be instant, that is be ready, in season and out of season. In season meaning those times are as convenient when people are wanting to hear it and act upon it. And out of season when, people, when it is not a convenient time because people do not want to hear it or do not want to act upon the word of God. He says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. That is to what? To apply the word of God to their lives. Reprove those who have fallen away, uh, or uh, correct those who are teaching error. Rebuke those who are falling uh, away. Exhort with all long suffering. That is, encourage with all long suffering. That is, patience and doctrine. Doctrine being sound teaching. Uh, and sound teaching, of course, is only from the word of God. He goes on to say, for us today, preaching is a fundamental work of the church. Mark 16 and verse uh, 15. Mark chapter 16 and verse uh, 15. It says, and he saith unto them, but whom, who, but whom say ye that I am? Uh, oh, sorry, I'm looking, I'm looking at Matthew. Mark, I hope I go to the right place. Mark 16 and verse 15. It says, and he said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, we do have some preachers today who believe that their only duty is preaching. We also have those who believe their duty is to do other things, and they spend very little time uh, preaching the gospel or spend very little time uh, preparing gospel uh, uh, lessons. <coughs> And Nathan says you could also add verses uh, 3 and 4 to that. Yes, most definitely. Uh, 2 Timothy uh, 4, verses 2 through 4 would uh, be a good reference there, as uh, Nathan's uh, pointing out. Uh, because people are turning away from the truth uh, and wanting to hear things that are uh, pleasing. Here where we're at in Oklahoma, and I'm sure we're not the only place, we have a big movement by the dot .tv churches. Uh, where congregations come together and they have a, a, a um, screen and projector set up. And as one person described it to me who attends one of these locations, says they have their own uh, Bible classes, their own praise and worship. But then when a sermon is time to, for the lesson, they turn on the projector and he listens to a man from another location. And, uh, you know, sometimes we used to call that, I might call that, a, you know, well, I guess it is TV church. Uh, when you think about that, I heard some some have said, you know, "Why would they go to a place like that when you do the same thing at home, watching uh, you know church on the TV?" And what's happening is that is they're doing these things in such way so that people can more easily uh, say what they want to say and teach what they want to teach in different locations, while at the same time uh, again getting very uh, a lot of funds from these groups. Uh, you know, I hear a lot of folks who go to these congregations and say, well, my kids love it. The kids enjoy it. Well, there's nothing wrong with a child enjoying church. We want them to enjoy church. We want to, them to enjoy it for the right reason. Uh, not to enjoy it necessarily because they're having fun, though they do have fun many times in their classes and they're singing songs and, and listening to the lessons and, and doing interactive lessons like that. But many times in these denominations, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about they're having like games and 
and activities that have very little, if anything, to do with spiritual growth. They dedicate their times to gymnasiums rather to, than to sound biblical teaching. And we go back here and look at Mark 16, verse 15. He says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, not go ye into all the world and entertain the world, but to preach the gospel. <clears throat> and it's not just in the, in the denominational congregations, but also within the Lord's church. We have those who have gone to that way. It's not the goal of the church to provide entertainment, Nathan says. That's correct. Uh, a sister where I was preaching at uh, a few years ago told me when she was telling me about her mother who had uh, passed away while we were there. She was in bad health the whole time we were there, and then she passed away uh, while we were there. And and she was so bad that she, I never heard her mother spoke or anything, speaking, speak or anything like that. But uh, her mother were told, uh, was quoted as saying, if you want to play with something, get a toy, but don't play with the Bible or don't play with the church. Uh, you think about that statement, well, that's very true. If you want to be entertained, then go to a football game, go to you know a play or do something like that. But when you come to church, come, I say come to church, when you come to worship services, I should say, uh, we come to worship. That's why it's called worship service, because we're coming to worship and to praise God. And when we get when we get into the entertainment business, uh, well, we find ourselves moving away from God. Uh, we have a summer series, what we call a summer series here, where we have different speakers come in on Wednesday nights. And we have our theme for this year being what the church needs now. And one of the lessons is, is what the church needs now is to, to avoid the entertainment business or to get out of the entertainment business because... We're not helping souls, we're hindering souls. Now, let's continue uh, looking here in the slide. He says, whether it's preaching or practicing, it needs to be done by the authority of Christ. And that's where, that's where the confusion really lies with these uh, different ideas, is that people no longer look for the authority in things. They say, well, what's the harm in it? Or, well, we like this, or, or you know, our kids like it. Well... No, not to be mean, but, you know, it doesn't matter what your kid's like. What matters is what the Lord demands. I was studying with a, uh, a gentleman here a few months ago, maybe it was last summer, and uh, he, t he told me that he was, they were going to another location because their kids uh, had France. He went there, so that's where they're going to go. Well, you know, as adults and as fathers being the heads of the, head of the house, as Christ says, uh, the husband's head of the wife, this is Christ's head of the church, uh, meaning that if the husband's head of the wife, and also the husband's head of the home, and the Christ and the church would be, or the church, the wife would be supportive of the husband. But, you know, what we have to remember is if the husband's the head of the home, and if the parents are the head of the home over the over their children, then where the children want to go worship, uh, it's not their decision to make. You know, we know that in some cases children can influence their, their parents to come to uh, services at the Lord's Church. But if the reasons our children wanting to go to worship somewhere is because there, is only because their friends are wanting to go to a location, especially if of the Lord's Church, we have someone who's wanting to go to another location because their friends are going there and they're having so much fun. That's a dangerous word. Uh, we need to be careful about that. And we need to make sure that they understand this is not their decision ultimately. It is a parent's decision. Uh, children are to be submissive to the parent. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that family still goes to that congregation. Verse 173, getting back to our, our text here, Psalm 119, verse 173, says, Let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. And Brother Patterson says we need to rely on God. Judah prevailed over Israel because she relied on God. And he puts in here 2 Chronicles chapter 13. Uh, 2 Chronicles 13, verse 18. that says, Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time. The children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. You think about that, rely, because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. You know, today, is, uh, more than ever, because we have so many technologies and things that are there to help us, we can do anything in, in an instant. Uh, uh, 
And we think that we no longer need a Lord, that what we, what we need God for. If I need food, I'll go to the grocery store. If I need, uh, you know, to communicate with somebody, I can just call them up on the phone. I don't, I don't need to ask for, for prayers for, for food, ask for prayers for safety as I travel to speak with this person or something like that, because we can do anything almost instantly. But we can still fail in, 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 a, in a point of time where we have so much technologies and instant things, uh, we still need God. Because these things cannot get us into eternal life. No one can get into eternal life thanks to their uh, computer alone. Now, and we know, of course, there are ways to learn about God on the computer. But I mean that by that is the computer is not the sole reason why they're gaining eternal life. It's still through God. So we still need God. First uh, Kings chapter one or First Kings chapter thirteen. Uh, verses 1 through 24, we're not going to read uh, that. But he talks about how there how the prophet was slain because he did not rely on God. Anytime we do not rely on God, we're going to have a life that's going to be difficult. And we think about those who do not rely on God and have a life of, of pleasure. We know that even though they may be enjoying times of pleasure, they also sometimes, if, if their life is very public, you read about how their life or how uh, depressing their life is and how uh, many times these individuals are the same ones who are, in draw, are involved in alcohol and drugs and cheating on their husbands and on their wives and, and all these different things, yet they're, they act as if they're happy when clearly they're not. You know, a person who is happy does not uh, cheat on their husband or on their wife. A person who is happy does not go out and drink and do drugs because if they're truly happy, they don't need those things to be happy. Uh, you know, you think about the world. If the world's going to be happy, they need things to help them be happy. They need their, their, you know, their motivational books and tapes, and they have to be told over and over again by the world, you're happy, you're happy, because you're doing this. When true happiness really comes from God, and the Lord gives us what we need. He gives us rest for our souls. He gives us the things that are actually required for us to have in this life, and he tells us that all these materialistic things in the, in the world that people think we have to have, he says they're not necessary. And that's a, one of the greatest things we, we could hear. Because the world's saying you have to have this, you have to have this. And the Lord says, what about possessions? He says that those things are what? Well, they're nothing. Uh, that uh, Well, let's look at what Alex has to say here. One point that can be made, we need to rely on God even when we desire or hope even when what we desire or hope for seems impossible. Abraham comes to mind in this, and look at what happened when he and Sarah failed to rely on God. And that is very true. We need to rely on God no matter uh, uh, what we think is, no matter if what we desire seems impossible. Uh, you think about all those things that seem impossible. You go back to Noah, uh, the biblical Noah, not the... Uh, Noah of uh, the movies, uh, the real Noah, <laughs> a man who built an ark for 120 years and got in it with his family of eight, and the Lord shut the door, not Noah, and they lived in that ark for, if I'm not mistaken, the whole time was about a year that the waters were on the earth, and they were in that boat, that ark, all that time, and what would seem impossible to them? Well, if you're Noah, you're thinking the Lord's going to flood the earth, he, he, you know, for us today, we know that's possible because we saw that, that happen in Noah's time. You think about the crossing the Red Sea. How could that be possible? Well, it happened, and it happened more than once. Uh, how could Christ, you know, how can we feed all these all these people as, as the, the disciples there of Christ were, were telling uh, Christ, you know, we have this, you know, some few loaves of bread and some fish, and yet he, seen, he feeds 5,000 people, and we're out, or, uh, 4,000 and 5,000. Reality, you know, as we've said before, I think if you included, you know, about four or 5,000 only included the men. It didn't include children and women, so it could have been twice or three times as much. Well, how do you feed the thousands and thousands of people with only a few things? Well, that's the power of God. Miracles, things happen. Now, today, we don't necessarily mean that the Lord's going to answer us in some miraculous way, but isn't it interesting sometimes how things work out? Is it interesting where you find yourselves 
and 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 how the Lord provides for you, and how sometimes the things we worry so much about when we put those things before before the feet of God, that we don't we really find out there's nothing to worry about at all. So we need to make sure we do rely on God fully. As uh, the Deuteronomy chapter 20, we see there, he tells us to cling to God, for he is your life the length of your days. Psalm 119, this time looking at verse 174, says, I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. And here Brother Patterson says, we need to desire the salvation that comes from God, and he said, he gives here three verses. And let's look first at Psalm 27 and verse 4. Psalm 27 and verse 4. It says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You notice what he says, One thing I have desired of the Lord. One thing he desires is to what? To be, he says, in the temple and to in inquire of the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. That's where he wants to be. And uh, I won't be, you know, be on the dead horse too much because we talked about this before, but the basic act of a Christian, one of the basic acts is coming to worship. And yet we have to argue and not argue, but fight with people sometimes it seems to get them to come and praise the God who sent his son to die for their sins and how sad it is. Second Samuel 23 and verse 5. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made me with an everlasting covenant, ordered, ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to, although he make it not to grow. Now, he says here, although my house be not so with God, yet he made me with an everlasting covenant. That is, that even though we have those in our house who do not obey God, they still have the chance to do what? To have eternal life. He's, uh, no, they're not going to have eternal life just because they're alive, but they have a chance of eternal life. He says, ye, ye, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. Now I'm going to jump over here to the New King James for a second. Look at verse 5. He says, Although my house is not so with God, yet he has made me with an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure, for this is, this is all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make its increase? Now, you think about that for a moment. Even though... That we may not be right in sight of God at all times. We still have the ability to come and gain eternal life. It's always there. He says, "For this is my all my salvation, all my desire, though He make it uh, not to grow." Now let's look next at Hebrews chapter eleven. Hebrews chapter eleven. Let's look at verse sixteen. He says, "But now they de they desire a better country, that is, and hev an, an heavenly." Whether wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And the point is here as we look at verse sixteen, as we saw in Second Samuel twenty three five and Psalm twenty seven four, is that excuse me, we need to desire the salvation that comes from God. Excuse me, my supper's <clears throat> making me burp a little bit here. We need to desire to have the salvation that comes from God and the salvation that only comes from God. Because, uh, you know, so many times we get caught up in things in the world, we forget, if we're not careful, that even though we may be doing so well, we still need the Lord in our lives. Psalm 119, verse 175 says, Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee, and let thy judgments help me. Now, Brother Patterson has given this verse a title, We Need to Allow God to Help Us. And he mentions here Hebrews 4, verse 16. We need to allow God to help us. And I'm continually amazed... Uh, with individuals who don't like to have their names placed on a prayer request list. Every congregation I know has a bulletin or has at least a list of those who ask for prayers. And I'm always amazed at those who say, well, don't put me down for, don't, don't put my name on there. I don't, I don't want anyone, I don't, you know, I don't want everyone knowing. You know, we can put our, someone's name on a prayer, prayer list without going through all the details. You know, I think, why won't you want someone to pray for you? Well, you know, it's, it's serious, you know, knowing when people ask. 
series of knowing people show concerns what they're really saying uh, you know they ask me before I even know anything well so what you know in reality big deal at least they care Hebrews 4 verse 16 says let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need you know we need to pray more and allow others to pray for us and the idea of not wanting to, to have everything known that's fine we don't have to let every detail be known but we shouldn't be hiding the fact that we need people to pray for us mark 9 verse 24 says and straightway and straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears lord i believe help that help thou mine unbelief it says maybe we need to have the attitude of the father in mark 9 verse 24 what is he praying for he's praying that he may what have more faith he says i believe help thou my unbelief you know i believe that you're son of god help me believe or maybe you know lock in his mind that god or that christ can really do this you know it's against nature it's it's uh not against nature should say it's above nature to be able to do the things that christ did uh, Psalm and the things that God did. Psalm 119, the very last verse, 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. And Brother Patterson has given this the title, We Need to Realize That Man Often Goes Astray. Man often goes astray because man, well, we're human beings. We make mistakes. One of the great truths of life is that man often goes astray. Isaiah 53 and verse uh, 6. Isaiah 53 is probably the single most powerful chapter, I think, within the Word of God. Isaiah 53 and verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned to, turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on, laid on him the iniquity of us all. Everyone at some point has fallen away, from, has gone away from God, or were separated from God. Whether it be before they became a Christian or after they became a Christian, every person has gone their own way at some point in their life. You look at First Peter chapter two and verse twenty-five. First Peter two and verse twenty-five says, "For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the Shepherd and Bishop of your souls." We need to realize that man, that we can go astray, and we need to make sure that we do our very best not to do so. Consider the ways one can be lost. And it says here, Luke chapter 15. And Luke chapter 15, we have the person who is too haughty or too, too arrogant to repent of their sins. And we have those who are... are uh, who are too bitter to repent of their sins. All these different things you can look at there in the parables of Luke chapter 15 and see all different ways a man can be lost. And we think about that, with all the ways man can be lost, we need to make sure we desire to have salvation, to receive salvation from God, do all we can to receive salvation. Now that brings our class tonight to a close.